we should all always have <clears throat> something that we are thankful to God for. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Um, you know, Dad was saying he kind of pushed me in a direction. I remember right out of high school, I graduated from the vocational school over at Inverness in October of 2000. And uh, we're going to diesel classes there and signed up to go to diesel college in Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, man, I know about a month before I started kind of getting homesick, I guess you would say. I, I started realizing, man, Nashville ain't where I needed to go. And I told Dad, I said, I, I don't think I want to go. He says, no, we done signed you up to be going. So I went up, went up there and went and made it through it and um, learned a lot and had to use hardly any of it since then. Um, I did do a lot of work with Dad when we had our mowing business, working on all, all the equipment and stuff. But to this day, I could care less to work on a vehicle. But, uh, you know, I've done all kinds of different things in life um, from mechanic to underground utilities to working out at the powerhouse to um, working at a, in a fast food joint to working in a retail business, um, doing roadside mowing and large acres mowing. But, you know, I, I look at all those things that I've done in life, and like Dad said, we go through things in life for a purpose. Um, God prepares us for ministry and four things that we're going to do in ministry. And, you know, I look back at the trials I've went through in life and the different things, um, how hard it was on me when I lost my grandfather. And then here two and a half, almost two and a half years into ministry and preaching like 12 or 14 funerals in that two and a half year period. And I think back and they, I think God was preparing me for that uh, when I lost my grandfather and uh, being able to make it through that time and uh, seeing how hard it was. And then just this week, having a gentleman come to me that had lost a family member this year, and he said, man, I'm at rock bottom. I need help. And to be able to sit down and talk to him and counsel with him and, and uh, hoping that I get another chance to sit down and talk with him and share with him some more and, and really witness to him. Uh, but this, this afternoon, we're going to talk about the end times. And uh, as a pastor, this is one thing I hear a lot about. You know, you hear a lot about end times. You get a lot of questions about end times. You get a lot of questions about, um, you know, what are things we're going to see during the end times and different things like that. And so tonight we're going to address the signs of the end times. And before we get started, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come to you tonight, Lord, just thank you for this evening that you've allowed us to come out here and worship you, Father. I thank you for allowing me to be your servant. And Father, I ask tonight that you would just use me and speak through me in a mighty way. Father, that we would hear from you and that we would understand the things that you've written in Scripture about the signs of the end times, Father. And help us to know and do what you've called us to do leading up to those things, Lord. I pray, Father, now that you just, again, speak through me in a mighty way and ask these things in your name. Amen. Um. Growing up in the church, I've heard people all the time, hey, we're living in the last days. Talking to somebody this morning, said, man, I grew up and that was kind of pushed out my throat. Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And, you know, we hear about that, you know, all the time. Oh, we're in the last days. Jesus is coming back any moment. And he could come back before we get done with this message tonight. But it could be another hundred years down the road also. And Matthew 24, 36 tells us, but of that day, an hour no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And we got to remember that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son are all one. But Jesus here, and this is Jesus speaking in this verse, he says that only my Father knows. Not even the angels know the timeline. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. He could come back in just a few minutes. Or it could be a hundred or a couple hundred years down the road. Some have even, or we, we've heard different people predict the end of times. Oh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end. And uh, the, the first time I believe I remember hearing about this or, you know, really maybe being old enough to understand what they were talking about or whatever was back in 99. You know, we're fixing to turn the century. 
We fix it to be 2000, and computers aren't going to roll over to 2000, the year 2000, and the whole world is going to end. I had an uncle that had property up in Georgia in the mountains, and he built a bunker, and he had enough food in there to last uh, who knows how long. You know, and people, I mean, he had a big diesel tank to, you know, to fuel his generator and to fuel his truck. And, you know, people went crazy over this. But we've had people predict a certain date. You know, the world's going to end on, you know, March 31st or whatever. Uh, just here recently, we know it was a, um, a year or two ago, the Mayan calendar was going to end. And, and, oh, my goodness, the world's going to end. You know, that's, that's the end of the world because the Mayan calendar ended. Well, I don't know about you, but my life don't revolve around the Mayan calendar. My, my life is revolves around God, and that's what he's called us to do. Amen. Some have even profited from predicting the end of time um, and profited from predicting Jesus' return. As I was studying for this sermon this week, I was reading of a guy that wrote a book back in 1988, and he sold 4.3 million copies of this book that Jesus was gonna, gonna return in the year of 1988. Now he didn't say a date, you know, he didn't say it was gonna be December or, or February, he said in the year of 1988, Jesus would return. He sold 4.3 million copies of that. Well, December 31st, 1988 came and went, obviously we're still here. And uh, so the man says, well, Jesus is gonna return in 1989 and wrote another book stating that and sold 400,000 copies of that book. December 31st, 1989 came and went, and still Jesus has not returned. I got to thinking about that. First, he sells 4.3 million copies of a book. All these people bought this book, read this book about Jesus returning in 1988. Jesus don't return, so he writes another book, and another 400,000 people with no brains buy his book. I mean, if he was wrong the first time, and you're going to buy another book? We still have people today. They claim Jesus is returning or predicting Jesus' return or the end of the world. A lot of these are even Christians, and some have even claimed to be pastors. People go out and they blow their whole life savings. They go out and go crazy. Oh, the world's going to end on you know, August 31st, so I'm going to go cash in all my retirement, all my life savings, and I'm going to go just enjoy life for the next few days just to find out that the world didn't end, that Jesus did not return. All these people needed to do was read God's word. Because my thought is, is if John Brown predicts that the world's going to end next Friday, to me, that's the last day Jesus is going to return, is next Friday. I just don't think that God would send Jesus back on a date that somebody's predicted that he would return on, or that the world would end on. That's just my thought, and maybe I'm wrong, but you know, that's just my thought there. I'm not here to predict an hour, a day, a century, a year, or anything. I'm not going to make a prediction, but we're going to look at the signs of God's return and God's word. We'll be looking again in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 14. As I said, I've heard this all the time, all throughout my life, about Jesus' return and the end of times. And, and I've even heard maybe some of you say that from time to time. But I don't think that every... But I do think that every generation since the apostles, including the apostles, have expected Jesus to return during their lifetime. The apostles asked a question here. How do we know the signs? They thought that Jesus would return during their lifetime. Now that was almost 2,000 years ago. We know Jesus died um, almost 2,000 years ago. The, the calendar started counting up at Jesus' birth. So he died 33 years after his birth. So we're not quite year, 2,000 years after Jesus' birth. But everybody, I believe, since that period of time, has thought that Jesus would return during their lifetime. Now prophets prophesied of Jesus' first coming, and all those prophecies were fulfilled that are in the Old Testament. But we have to look at Scripture and see that Jesus' second coming is prophesied just as much or more. And we have to know and, and stand on the promise that those will be fulfilled also. So let's look at what the scripture says. Matthew 24, 3 through 14. I'm going to read these scriptures for you. In verse 3 it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when, we will, when will these things be? 
And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated for, by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be out offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then many false hmm. prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. We're going to look at the signs here. The first sign we're going to look at is, in, is found in uh, verse 5 there. It says that for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. That first sign there is the false Christ. There's been an estimated 1,100 people who have come claiming to be Christ. 1,100 people that have claimed, saying, I am Christ. People like Jim Jones, who led 1,000 people to commit suicide in, in uh, Guyana. Then there was Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate cult, invited 36 people to follow a comet to another galaxy. Adolf Hitler ordered that he be presented as a defied Messiah. Then there is the, the radical followers of Muhammad, believing they will be rewarded for killing Christians and others as they call others they call infidels. There's a man in Miami. You can look it up on YouTube. I've watched the video a number of times. He goes around claiming that he is Jesus Christ. Not that he is a prophet of Jesus. Not that he is a teacher of Jesus, but he is Jesus Christ. And that's what he goes around the world preaching and claiming to be. He has had people donate multi-million dollar homes to him. To him. They've donated Lear jets to him. They've do donated high-priced sports cars and different things. Millions and millions of dollars have been given to this so-called Jesus Christ. People quit their jobs to follow him. Sold out their life savings to give to his ministry or whatever you want to call it. The second sign we see there is in verses 6a and 7a. And it says there in 6a, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And then 7a says, for nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. This sign is wars and rumors of war. Ru rumors of wars in all areas of the world now occur frequently. Thanks to the instant media coverage. And the availability of multitude of 24-hour news sources. You can hear about a war that's going on on the other side of the world right now by just turning on the news. You can hear about rumors of war by just pulling up Facebook and scrolling down through Facebook. Just this week, President Trump warned North Korea he would, uh, that they would face fire and fury like the world has never seen if they keep threatening the United States of America. In response, North Korea said it is seriously examining a plan to launch missile strike targeting an area near the U.S. territory of Guam. And I tell you, a lot of people, and I've never done the research and never really looked into this, but a lot of people believe that the, the world will end due to a nuclear strike, due to no, nuclear warfare. People, you know, countries sending nuclear warheads from one country to another, and that's what's fixing to come about. That's what North Korea is trying to do right now. There is constantly wars and rumors of wars in the Middle East. Just start studying the Middle East. They're constantly at war over there, whether it's a civil war or one country fighting against another. Israel is constantly defending themselves against other nations, trying to come in and take the promised land that God has given them. Then there's the terrorist. Then there's the terrorist. We don't know who these people are. You know, just a few years ago, we always thought they were Muslim. 
But just look at some of these shootings that have happened in the last year or so. Some of these are white American people that have converted into, into the Islam religion. And they've become radicals. We don't know who these are. They could be living right next door and we would never know. So we hear of wars and rumors of wars constantly. The third sign we see is in verse 7b. And it says there, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. I, I think you can agree with me that, that sickness, disease, starvation is becoming an epidemic in this world today. Kids right here in America, probably the richest nation in the world, or one of them, there's people right here in America that are starving to death. They're going to bed hungry tonight, right here in our own country. There's new diseases seem to appear regularly. Mm -hmm. You know, think about cancer. How terrible cancer is. I don't know, 50, 100 years ago, they didn't know what, have a clue what cancer was. We got AIDS and SARS, bird flu, Ebola, mad cow disease. And then they, these diseases, these super diseases that wiped out a whole lot of people back, you know, just 50, 60 years ago are resurfacing. They're coming back even stronger. Then there are the earthquakes. The World Almanac tells us that there were only 21 earthquakes of major strength between the years 1000 and 1800. But between 1800 and 1900, there were 18 major earthquakes. And the next 50 years, between 1900 and 1950, there were 33 major earthquakes. Then between 1950 and 1991, there were 93 major earthquakes. Also, tri uh, almost tripling the, the number of the previous half century and claiming the lives of 1.3 million people around the world. Now, you know, we could sit here and debate that and say, well, you know, 100 years ago, they didn't have a, a lot of technology that we have today to really, we're not talking about minor earthquakes, we're talking about major earthquakes here. So we see the number of, and intensity of earthquakes are, is at a, a level higher today than any other time in history. Look at all the crazy weather patterns we are having. I heard somebody just the other day right here in the church say, you know, we haven't had a, a winter, a real winter here in Florida in two or three years. What we would call a winter. You know, we haven't had, I don't think we had a frost at all last year. You know, I, I think that there may have been a little frost in one little area, but not like a hard freeze. We didn't have any kind of real hard freeze this past year. Horrific tornadoes, unmerciful hurricanes, floods in, in regions that you'd have never believed that would have flooded. Places that are already saturated are being flooded. Drought. We just come off of a time of dry season here, a drought. Hot, dry climates that could use some rain. Record-breaking heat waves have been recorded in the last two decades. And then there is the wildfires that have scorched thousands upon thousands of acres right here in the state of Florida just this year. And there's currently a wildfire burning out in the west of the United States right now. So we've seen the weird patterns of, of weather. Places that we would have never thought of getting things that they never heard of. The next sign we see is in verse 9. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The next sign we, uh, the, and that sign is there is hated by all nations. Christianity, Christians are being persecuted all over the world right now as we speak. Christianity is the most persecuted religious group in the world today. In every country of this world, to, once, to, to some extent or another, Christians are being persecuted. Every country in the world today, Christians, to one extent or another, that could be they're being beheaded all the way down to just being persecuted verbally. Christians are being persecuted. We even see that right here in the United States of America. Now, I don't know of anybody being killed. That's, well, I take that back. We had that shooting here just a few year, uh, just a year or so ago in a prayer meeting in the Carolinas where somebody walked in, sat down, sat through the part of the prayer meeting, and then got up and started shooting people. That's why I pack a gun now. <laughs> Let somebody walk in my door with a gun. We're going to battle it out. Because the way I look at it is you're my sheep. I'm here to protect you. We've seen people lose their whole life 
savings, their, their jobs, their businesses, because they would not make a cake for a homosexual. Because they would not make a flower arrangement for a homosexual marriage. They lost everything because they stood up for their belief. The fifth sign is found in verse 11. It says that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Some false prophets are Joseph Smith of the Mormons, Charles Taz Russell, ben, Benny Hill, who falsely predicted that all homosexuals in America would die by fire in the late 1990s. He has confessed that there are nine beings within the Godhead, three beings each having their own trinity of beings within each other. This guy claims that God the Father is three, God the Holy Spirit is three different people, and God the Holy Spirit. That God the Son is three different people to make up nine beings of the Godhead. I don't know where this fruit would come from, but <laughs> he then stated that that uh, on TV and N that after his crusade in South America in 2002, that he was certain that he would return to America with video footage of Jesus appearing on the stage during his crucifixion during his crusade because Jesus had told him he would. He also stated that, that very soon, people would no longer need to take their, their loved ones to the morgue. All they had to do was put them in front of the TV, and when TV in come on, they would rise from the dead. And people follow this nonsense because they're not reading the Word of God. Carlton Pearson supported support of the doctrine of occlusion, exclusion. This doctrine tries to reconcile Christianity and Islam, claiming the two religions are completely compatible. In other words, he's saying that Islam and Christianity are one and the same. They're both the same. He also stated, or claims, that no one will go to hell. He's obviously not reading the same book as I am. Oh, he would be sad when he wakes up in hell. 2 Peter 2, 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves with destruction. I think the false prophets, I think of some of these mega churches, and I'm not going to throw out any names there, but you start watching some of these mega churches and, and listen to them. When do they preach against sin? When do they ever talk about hell in their services? Their prosperity gospel. I believe some of these mega churches are leading people down the wrong path. Amen. They're not telling them that, you know what, if you don't change and repent of your sins, you're going to hell. People need to hear that because that's the way to salvation is repent, turn from your sin. The sixth and final sign here, as we see, is in verse 12. It says there, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. As the world gets more and more wicked, there will be less and less love. Are we not seeing that today? As Christians are persecuted and wickedness abound, even the Christians will not know who to trust. And so Christians will become shy and even suspicious one of another. And so love comes to nothing. When we're being persecuted... You don't know if the next guy you sit down at the dinner table with is going to beat you over the head because you believe in God or you worship Jesus Christ. You're not going to want to sit at that dinner table with that guy. We're not going to know who we can trust. It is sad, but there will come a time in this world when there will be little, if any, love in this world. People will not love on others with the fear of being hurt, with the fear of being killed. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 3 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. We're seeing all of that right now. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Some translation says, call them birth pains. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Like a woman going into labor, the pain starts slowly. One contraction, 
A couple minutes later, maybe there's another contraction, but as she gets closer and closer to labor, those contractions come closer and closer together. The pain gets more and more intense. Christ is telling us that the increase in the number of disasters, the more we hear these signs coming about, they will increase in severity. And what we are witnessing today is just the beginning. Again, we don't know. Christ could come back any minute. But it could be another hundred years down the road. Verse 6b says, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. It says, Do not be frightened. Do, do not be troubled. Do not fear, as mentioned 365 times in the Bible. That is a do not fear on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord. As Christians, yeah, things are going to get scary. But you know what? We've already won the victory. We sang victory right. to Jesus this morning. We've already won the victory. We ain't got nothing to worry about. Because you know what? As the Bible says, they can kill this flesh. But they cannot affect my eternal right. destination. So let them kill me. Because I know where I'm going. In, in closing, look at verse 14. It says there, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The gospel will be preached to all nations, then the end will come. Think about that. The gospel will be pre preached to all nations. We have more ways today to get the gospel message out than ever before. Mm. We got radio. We got TV, and now we have the internet. I can take this video that my wife's videoing right now, this sermon, and, and sometime this week, post it on YouTube. And anybody in this world that has the internet, no matter where they're at, as long as they have an internet connection, they can pull that video up and watch it mm -hmm. right now. The gospel message has a better way to get to all nations of the world right now. Missionaries are being sent to places that they can't even tell you about because if somebody found out, they would be beheaded. Yeah. So is Jesus coming back to my lifetime or your lifetime, my kid's lifetime? I can't answer that. I'm going to be honest with you. As I was talking to somebody this morning, I'd love, I'd love to see Jesus come back in my lifetime. Yeah. I'd love to be here when the rapture happens. I'd love to be walking through the field or standing here preaching. I, I showed a video one time. There was a church service. There weren't very many people there, about like tonight. And all of a sudden, a BAM! And about five people were left in that building. Everybody else was gone. <laughs> Can you be imagined sitting in a church house and the rapture happened and look around and you're left? I don't know about you, but that's, uh, that's scary. You got to know where you're at. You got to know what you're going on in your life. But I'd love to be standing behind this pulpit when Jesus comes back. That'd be so awesome. <laughs> to be here on this earth when Jesus called us home. Looking at these signs, it, it, these signs, it does seem that we are very close. 2 Peter 3 8 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. We don't know God's timing. That's right. Again, He can come back today. It could be another thousand years down the road. We don't know. But we do know. And we can stand on the promise that one day, whether it's in our lifetime or somebody else's lifetime, he will return for his people. Amen. Acts 1.7 says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. We can stand on the promise that Jesus is going to return. It's the time. Is the time drawing close to Jesus' return? It seems to be, but we have to remember Matthew 24, 36. No man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, but only the Father in heaven. We have to trust in God the Father because his timing is perfect. His timing is perfect. A lot of us would say, man, Jesus, come back right now. I don't have to worry about the bills i got to pay tomorrow. Come back right now. But his time is perfect. I heard somebody say one time, if Jesus isn't going to come back, until the last person has come to salvation right. and he's planned and called to come. So then the question needs to be, are you ready to stand before God? If the rapture did happen right now, would you be taken? That's the important thing. 
the signs are things that we need to watch for. But I think of this, I, I think of the rapture, I think of Jesus coming back and all those things as, as something to energize me, something to get me excited about going out and telling other people about Jesus Christ. Because our job as Christians is to make sure that our loved ones, our friend, family, our friends, those around us are ready for that rapture. That they're going to go to heaven when it all comes down to it. And if, if you had to stand before God tonight, ask yourself this one question. If I had to stand in front of God tonight, would he tell me to enter heaven or exit to hell? Because that's what it boils down to. You know, it doesn't matter how much you've given to the church or how many times you sat in that pew. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. You can be the best citizen in the United States of America. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, you're going to hell. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.